alive, haunters. You are entering a story about Geist, the Sin Eaters. Welcome to the Chroniclers of Darkness, a narrative horror podcast set in the RPG New World of Darkness. Due to adult language and the violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 2, Grand Theft Corpus. God damn it, a hoarder house. They go unchecked for so long it just gives way to tragedy. By the time you get to them, they're what the HGTV calls unflippable. Too scared of other people to call in the super, moisture and mold just eats away at the whole structure of the house. I am in my nice pumps on a mercilessly humid Saturday. And I'm knee-deep in takeout containers, newspapers, magazines, and empty cans. Slowly, I wade through, carving a path toward the front door. But the smell hits me once I turn the corner, sharp like a fancy cheese. I hear footsteps near me, but the garbage doesn't shift. Something's moving toward me fast. I turn and come face to face with the dead homeowner, skin dried like a plum and draped in a rattled shawl. Honey, not before I've had my coffee. The ghost vanishes and I follow her into twilight holding the black-boned daddy's spectral hand with my own. He may tower above me, but he uses his gold-tipped cane to point out the ghost of Mrs. Reynolds. She scurries more like a rat than a woman over the shadowy piles of garbage toward a trapped corner. Maybe I can find her fetter and remove her so she doesn't terrify the movers or volunteer trash collectors I'll need to call in. According to the landowner, Mrs. Reynolds has been on rent control since 1986, and he salivates over the idea of remodeling, subdividing, and upcharging for a spacious three-bedroom unit. Swap out the neighborhood staple for three Columbia graduates with trusts, and his day looks a little brighter. But nobody had seen her in months. She fell behind on the rent and neighbors complained about a mold smell coming from their ceiling. There's a precarious mound of bags against what will make a beautiful south-facing window. The pile is lower, as if they tumbled down recently. This poor woman must have been crushed under her own throne of garbage. My hands are slick with sweat by the time I uncover the couch with the greasy black stain that was once Mrs. Reynolds white outlines of her dissolved skeleton total putrefaction black mold has already grown atop some of the plastic trash bags making them crumble into a composter's dream or a realtor's nightmare fuck i have to report this to the police her anchor must be close maybe she'll tell me hello ma'am what ties you to this world Is it small, like a purse? Can I carry it down the stairs? She looks down at her melted motif toward the couch. The entire couch. When they say you can't take it with you, they mean it. A lifetime's worth of anxiety and fear, and the most you get to leave is a stain. Alive to dead, solid to liquid, ashes to ashes. There's a thickness in the air, though beyond the reek of rot. Something in my ghost sight. It's a set of keys, lucky rabbit's foot, feathers wrapped in leather. It radiates death energy, the kind I can suck ectoplasm from instead of leaping the fence and sleeping in St. Anthony's Cemetery. Maybe a bargaining chip if I run into another sin eater. Not sure how Mrs. Reynolds has it, but she won't exactly be needing it. Later that night, I do some Merlot-based self-medicating and researching back at my apartment. Partly to compile a list of buyers for Mrs. Reynolds' place, and partly to follow up on Robbie's case. When Robbie spoke to me through that fortune teller three nights ago, 
He gave me the clues. Monroe and the cemetery. Plenty of Monroes have passed through New York. But how to narrow it down? Which Monroe? Which cemetery? There's an old legend about Odin, the father god of Vikings. According to the legend, Odin tied himself to the world tree, effectively sacrificing himself to himself as a shortcut to forbidden knowledge. Every culture has legends about shortcuts. The thing is, as one of the bound, I am a walking cheat code to the rules of life and death. Leslie read the contract and wrote in his own loopholes. So I'm wondering where Robbie's soul is, what he had to give up in order to finally contact me. It's later in the evening, and I snap awake on my couch, tasting lipstick and finding a handful of fake eyelashes scattered across my shirt. Motherfucker. The black bone daddy was trying to doll me up and send me out for the night. My buzzer rings suddenly. Did he order takeout just to seduce the delivery guy again? There's no one at the front step. So I open the door and look down. It's a toy car, a micro-machine. If you remember those, my stepbrother had a huge collection. It rolls along my hallway and turns the corner toward the stairs. My geist urges me to follow the toy, and I do. At the top of the stairs... Nearly a dozen more tiny toy cars launch themselves down. Then I hear the rush behind me. The entire hallway is squirming with toy cars, leaving bloody streaks everywhere on the floor. Some of them gliding over the walls and ceilings like cockroaches, their tiny tin axles bouncing like living insects. All converging where I am. I need to levitate. I need to key into the cold wind to activate the shroud and hover. But at the last minute, my geist denies me. I fail to float. The wave of cars trips me up immediately, and I miss the banister and flail wildly, tripping over myself, the side of my face crunching against a stone step. The cars are racing over me, getting caught in my hair, racing up my pant leg, pushing me down with their collective mass. The black bone daddy is laughing at me and riling at the stings of pain and the violation. I push my mind into my geists and force him to switch on the call. My windshield whips around me, launching off the plastic toys and splaying them over the lobby. Even more start to pour down the stairs. I pull myself up and hurry out the front door. The toy cars dissipate the moment they cross the building's threshold. I must have sprained something. There's white fuzz around my vision. And in that fog, I can make out my car parked in the street. Its lights turned on, illuminating this black, foggy shape in the driver's seat. Then I remember those weird keys with a rabbit's foot. I check, and they're not in my pocket anymore. Motherfucker. I just got carjacked by a ghost. This podcast is brought to you by Nirvana's Path, your one-stop app for relaxation. Looking at your phone all day can make life seem like an endless nightmare corridor, but it doesn't have to be. You deserve to climb the ladder toward your better self, and your journey starts with the right breathing technique. Would you like a free sample? (laughs) Who wouldn't? Join me by sitting straight up and placing your left open palm over your right shoulder. Breathe in. Take in the whole world. As you breathe in, pull your left hand to your left shoulder. Now down your side to your hip. Now breathe without hubris, but with purpose. During this clarity, trace a lowercase letter C with your left hand. Repeat six times. Imagine that symbol in your mind. Let that symbol cast a spell of relaxation over you. Hold that symbol in your mind. Can you name that symbol in your moment of clarity? Does it call to you to wake up and take life by the reins? Don't wait. Download Nirvana's Path today and find enlightening beyond this world. This podcast is brought to you by Union National Securities, protecting you, your loved ones, and your country. Don't let illegals who go bump in the night tell you why their protection is more important than yours. 
Call Union National Securities today for a free consultation from one of our security experts who will tell you why America isn't safe anymore. Set yourself up with safety and peace of mind. Union National Security. Walls protect. Help. 2009 self-driving Honda Civic, 120,000 miles in need of an oil change and an exorcism. Last seen pulling onto 287 sloppily, leaving a trail of shattered side mirrors. If I still had a crew, I'd have backup. Or we'd have a contingency plan. Or someone other than me who wouldn't be responsible for every fucking black mirror incident. Everything was in my car. My purse was in the trunk. I had loose cash sewn into the back seat for emergencies, an empty bottle of gin for smelling. Even my keystone shot glass was in the glove compartment. I asked the Blackbone Daddy if he can follow the trail for our keystone. After all, it contains a piece of both of our souls. When I first died, he made me drink from it after he filled it, sealing that my soul and body would harness his memories and his powers. I was really hoping it wouldn't involve his consciousness, too, but two souls, one body. He wants me to red light in exchange for helping me. I don't have the time or the patience for that. He says he'll move my body for me and I can rest. I tell him no and stonewall him. Eventually, reluctantly, when his bony grip tightens from my shoulder to my neck, I hold my breath until I feel my face turning blue. He gives me an address. I call a green cab and head to a car repair shop near Sunnyside. Quiet, hollow brick monuments that once housed industry and construction, now storage units or loading docks for Chinese newspapers. I have to find my car and shut down whatever is haunting those keys before more people get hurt. Or he runs up my easy pass. I doubt a thrill seeker is going to obey traffic laws. Inside one of these industrial loading docks, under a series of flickering fluorescent tube lights, I see somebody. Tall and thin, taller than I. Long brown raincoat, almost a shaved head. Whoever they are, they're standing off against my car like a pixie matador. The car honks its horn and spins its wheel in place, kicking up God knows how much cement dust and untouched garbage. The person facing my car moves their hands and I see free floating streaks of pink light wherever their hand dances. It's no good, love, the person calls out. Can't carry a car's weight with tires made of balloon-grade rubber. The car lurches forward angrily and I can finally make out the ghost in the driver's seat. Motorcycle helmet with red glowing eyes. The ghost tries to pull a Christine, but all four tires burst beneath it. The person in the trench coat laughs and spins in place happily and I can see a jean skirt and Union Jack halter top and too many bracelets. The person sees me, looks up, and then I feel them lock eyes with the black bone daddy. Her face drops. I recognize the fight or flight instinct washing away her confidence. When my car crawls towards us on sparking wheel hubs, trench coat waves her hands like a joint popping break dancer and the car stops. Be with you in just a sec, she calls to me. Just gotta play stop and goza with this spook, then we'll talk, okay? She draws more pink light in the space in front of her, and I swear the symbols are hanging in midair. It's in the ignition, I yell. They're the conduit. Cool, thanks. I hear the ghost in my car wail in rage and agony. My entire car buckles and lurches off the ground. Gossamer smoke trails of fading ectoplasm leak from the cracks and dents. Wait, wait, I call out to her. Don't destroy the car. Little Miss Trenchcoat reaches inside and pulls out the haunted car keys, and the rabbit foot crumbles to dust. The fuck did you do? I yell. Snip, snip. Nothing personal. Dangerous ghost. No more anchor. No more poltergeist. Speaking of poltergeist, she says, moving quickly away from me but not turning her back. I can feel the black-boned daddy bristling with anticipation. 
He's excited that she sees him. He loves scaring anything with a pulse. Ma'am? She calls to me. You're about to have a colossal headache. You can't see it, but you're being flesh-ridden. Your soul is not an Uber, so it's time your passenger pissed off. She moves her hand like she's knocking an arrow, and streaks of pink light trace her movements. Whatever you're about to do, don't. Whatever you see above me, he's with me. He is me. Do not provoke him. Jesus Christ, are you even listening? The woman winks and snaps her fingers. Like when a dentist hits a nerve and keeps drilling, I feel my geist buckle and convulse. I drop to my knees, unable to breathe. Someone in stilettos is doing jumping jacks on my sternum, and the black bone daddy is wailing in pain. Fear. He calls into my mind. Make them no fear. No, I say in my mind. Confidence, lure them in. Make her feel confident that we're down. Trust me. I unlock the marionette with my passion's key and feel the powers manifest around me. Trenchcoat leans down to help me up. I've been paired up with my geist long enough to know how a predator feels and what they expect from easy prey. The woman holds my hands, says reassuring words, gently shushes me, and I lock eyes with her, and I grab her shirt and I punch her. She's taller than I'm used to striking, so instead of her head, I hit her dead on in the throat, and my fist connects with something solid in her neck. She drops, coughing and kicking. Next to her on the pavement, a silicone slip-in breast has landed sideways. Ah, oh, shit, now I feel awful. The person on the ground pulls themselves up slowly, holding up their hand in surrender. I mean, I thought breaking the car was vulgar, but punching me in the throat is just a dick move. <coughs> so he's with you, right? They say after catching their breath, pointing to my geist. Yes, I say, he's with me. I died, he brought me back. It's a long story, but he's not possessing me. We work together. You can see him clearly? Are, are you one of us? What? A necromancer? Yes, but only in the using magic to influence the dead kind of way. Are you going to hit me again? The voice doesn't match her body, like she's forcing her voice to go falsetto. No, I'm not going to hit you. Are you going to try and sever us again? Because that would kill us both, and I need to get some shit out of my car first. Oh, so it's your car! Whoops. Sorry. Oh, fuck my titties. They complain as they wipe off the dust from their rubber breast and try to shove it back into place. I'm a transplant. I was studying over in Wisconsin, but business has been picking up in the last year, so even us junior alchemists are getting called in to the New York. Look, I don't want to fight. Just know that there are more people like me, living people with Casper's riding shotgun. And separating the dead from the living means more than just putting a hatchet to every silver cord you come across. Hey, are you hungry? There's a 24-hour diner on the other side of Queens Boulevard. I feel bad about hitting a, you know, someone like you. Nah, don't worry about it. Wizards get into fights all the time. I almost took a lightning bolt to the ass just last week. No, I'm, I'm in a person of transitory, you know, I mean, uh, L-G-B-L-T, uh, someone like you. What, you've never met a transgender before? Are you for real, love? This is New York City. Of course I have. I just never punched one. Oh! Yeah, whatever. Ashes to ashes and all that. Hey, if it'll make your white guilt feel any easier, I can punch your ally card so other gays know you're cool. I said I was sorry. Oh no, I accept. I would love to talk with you, though. So, you and Mr. Bone Jangles here are fascinating. You are a mystery. And fate has placed us on each other's path right as I'm about to grab a meal with my mentor. Besides, my friend, I need help crossing over. I have been looking for an easy way to the land of the dead. If I shake your hand, will you try to sever me from my geist? Okay, then. Paranoia is healthy. I respect that. I don't blame you. Let's just wave to each other, okay? Hi, I'm Charlie. Moros at large. Nix of the silent. You and I are going to go to a very selective, gated community. I can feel it, Nix of the silent. An Avernian 
gated community. Chroniclers of Darkness is written and produced by Uncle Yo, with performances by Monica Blaze Levitt. Original music by Jimmy Lin. Logo by Jesse Pascal. Special thanks to Onyx Path Publishing for giving us a whole new world of darkness to haunt. Game on. Include everyone. And remember that death is only the beginning. Mm-hmm.